Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. My name is Nicholas Reed from Reed Corporate, and it's a great pleasure on behalf of Centaurus Metals to in, uh, welcome you to the special investor presentation following the release earlier today of the company's value add scoping study for the Jaguar nickel sulphide project in Brazil. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Darren Gordon, the Managing Director of Centaurus, to present you this afternoon. Um, it's been a, a very busy 18 months or so for Centaurus with the delivery of the maiden resource, um, a scoping study on a base case processing option, and now today uh, the delivery of a scoping study on a value add option, which uh, includes some pretty remarkable numbers, impressive NPVs, IRRs, and uh, most importantly, outlines a pathway for Centaurus to become a supplier of nickel sulfate directly into the rapidly growing lithium ion battery market. I'd like to welcome Darren to the, uh, to the, to the webinar. Great, thanks Nicholas. Thank yeah. Great pleasure to be here to, uh, to really talk everyone through the, uh, the fantastic results that we've had today from the value adding scoping study. Um, as Nicholas alluded to, we've actually done a, a lot of work over the last 18 months um, we delivered a base case scoping study in, in March this year, which had some impressive numbers in its own right, but uh, the, the numbers that we're seeing coming out of the value add scoping study for the production of, of nickel sulphate uh, take it to the next level. So <clears throat> I guess today we'll walk through that and uh, hopefully uh, it gives people a bit more insight into in where we're headed with the project. We've seen a few of those in our time, talking about uh, production targets and forward-looking statements. I guess when we when we think about what Centaurus is trying to do uh, with its project in Brazil, um, we've always thought about this project as a as a globally significant project, and I think the work that we've done over the last little while has only uh, confirmed in our mind that that is the case. We've always been trying to target a twenty thousand ton per annum um, nickel to be a nickel producer, um, and to try to do that by the end of twenty twenty four. So the results that we've sort of put out today with the with the scoping study, I think, will feed uh, nickel sulphate into a market that's only going to be growing. So, you know, if you look at where um, the market is headed and the demand for EVs, I think that thematic is real. I don't think anyone's denying that that thematic is is one that we uh, can tap into. And the production of nickel sulphate does put us directly into a position where we're dealing with the end users of the product. Um, we think that that demand is going to grow strongly. Um, we think that you know the production of green nickel is going to be hugely important uh, as we move forward. And being a sulphide project that is um, producing predominantly from renewable source power uh, gives us a big advantage um, from a carbon emission perspective. So we think that uh, for us, um, the market is going to be very strong for our product. So just touching on the on the economics themselves, um, I, we've got a, a very large resource base from which we started from over 550,000 tonnes of contained nickel. Uh, from that, we've got mill feed of about 30 odd million tonnes at 1% nickel. That'll give us about 260,000 tonnes of, of nickel being uh, processed through the uh, concentrator and hydrometallurgical circuit. And the outcome of that is a, an amazing 1.1 uh, billion NPV on a post-tax basis with an IRR over 50%. Um, we've also got very low cost, which is leading to high margins. Um, so, yeah, that in turn delivers relatively quick payback. Um, the development capital sitting around about $280 million. Um, we think that's well within our means for the amount of uh, money that this project can generate. And we're sort of looking at in the order of about 190 million US dollars per year once we're up and running and, and in production. I think the other side of this project for us is, is the fact that we will continue to be doing a lot more exploration. We've, we think that even with 560 odd thousand tonnes of contained nickel, there's still plenty more uh, metal to be found. Uh, there's a lot of exploration activity going on at the moment, and we're looking to increase the number of rigs that we have on site um, through the course of June, uh, bringing another three diamond rigs to the project. So when we look at, I guess, the base case, which is production of a nickel concentrate to the production of, of uh, nickel uh, sulphate, you can see the, the mark change in the economics. So from a $600 million post-tax MPV, we're able to lift that up to about 1.1 billion, um, very significant increase. That's driven off the back of um, the fact that we can 
we have a higher revenue stream, but that higher revenue stream also allows us to make the pits bigger, have more mineral mineralization coming out of the underground areas. We've got more underground um, deposits available to us uh, in the value added case. And so the combination of all these higher recoveries and the, the higher uh, nickel price that will be applied to nickel sulfate leads itself to these very impressive set of uh, economic numbers. As I said, the, the operating costs are low, which in turn drives a, a very nice margin uh, over $4 per pound of, of nickel. So where we are, um, you know, if people listening today may already be aware of where we're located in the northern part of Brazil. Uh, it's the Carajás Mineral Province. It's a uh, infrastructure rich region of Brazil. Um, there's big airstrips, um, there's big cities, um, a lot of the service providers are there. There's plenty of labour available to us. There's high voltage power lines, um, sealed access and a railway out to the coast. So all of those things in combination put us in a good position to be able to deliver this project. Um, and I think one of the key things about moving it down the value added path is access to power. So we have 138 kilovolt um, uh, power line at Tukuma, 40 k from where the project is. and that can take all the power that we need to site for the um, for the production of nickel sulfate. You can see that the area where we're located is in uh, relatively flat open farmland, um, so really no impediments to getting the project up and running. As I touched upon, the, the power side of it is going to be important, particularly when you're looking at the production of nickel sulfate. Uh, we're in a low power cost environment because most of the power in Brazil is renewables. So a large portion of it is hydro and you can sort of see pictures of those sort of hydro dams that do exist there, they're very significant. Uh, the solar uh, generation is growing and with all of that, you know, puts us in a, a good position from a carbon emission perspective, but also means that our power costs are going to be relatively inexpensive on a global scale. Um, and that's what's feeding through into the low operating costs. Um, our, the towns where we're based, they've got a ready-made workforce. There's a operating nickel laterite mine only 15 kilometres away from us at Onsa Puma. Um, so we know that we've got good access to personnel and people to be able to work on the project. And we feel like more broadly, when we ship out of this part of Brazil, we're, we're going to be able to access the market that is crying out for this uh, nickel sulphate to go directly into the, into the batteries. So the resource we've uh, we've talked about a little bit, 562,000 tonnes of, of contained nickel metal. Um, we convert a large portion of that to uh, mill feed. So about 60% of that comes across as mill feed uh, in the current uh, design of the project. Um, there's a large portion of the mineralisation is sitting in open pits, again, which is leading to our lower operating costs. Uh, obviously also uh, makes the, the process itself a little uh, bit less complicated. Um, we don't need to dive straight into underground deposits. Uh, they come in from about year four to year six. But I think overall, when you look at the the, um, the cost of what we've had to do to date, um, the acquisition discovery cost is very low. So at two cents a pound, uh, there's not too many projects like this where you can have that sort of uh, low rate of uh, discovery and acquisition cost. So the mill feed, as I said, is about um, 360,000 tonnes of, of nickel metal, um, so production target, and then for the mill feed will be about 340,000 tonnes. Once we actually put that through the circuit, we're recovering about 260,000 tonnes of contained nickel in sulphate. Um, that's giving us a 13-year mine life. So we think that that's the start of it, but a 13-year mine life in a project like this that's got an IRR over 50%, um, we think that makes for a very significant uh, project and one that should be quite appealing to investors. The process flow sheet uh, is a, a concentrate flotation circuit um, at the front end, uh, followed by a hydrometallurgical circuit um, with pressure oxidation at the back end. Um, we produce a nickel uh, sulphate product as well as a mixed sulphate precipitate, uh, which has got zinc, uh, cobalt and some nickel in it as well. Um, our recoveries coming out of the concentrate circuit are around 82% uh, for this process. So everything that uh, we've got here um, seems relatively straightforward. We don't feel like there's anything too complex in the, in the way that the process circuit is set up, um, which will allow, avail us of being able to build this project uh, pretty comfortably. 
And when you look at the, the layout of the project, um, one of the things that's uh, obviously uh, become an issue in Brazil in the last few years has been tailings dams. Um, we're looking at uh, putting in an integrated wasteland form, which is used quite extensively throughout Western Australia and Australia for that matter, as the highest safety factor against embankment failure but it's also going to allow us to optimise our waste removal. So when we you know, start uh, opening up our pits, uh, that material coming out of the pits as, as waste material will be uh, the first material going into construction of the IWL. Um, the only better place to put tailings is into a disused pit and we'll be able to do that once we're into our mine life. But you know, the IWL is a very, very neat solution for um, what we think should be the way forward in Brazil. Um, from a tailings dam perspective. And I think the, the aspect that, that really comes home uh, from a time perspective is, is the environmental approval process. Um, that is still going to be the time determining factor to first production at the targeted for the end of 2024. Um, all of the wet and dry season uh, data collection has been completed. We've just been waiting for the scoping study to be finished so that we can put um, the, um, I guess, the design of the project into the environmental impact assessment. So we'll only be a few months away from being able to lodge that document. Um, that really starts the environmental approval process and we'll be targeting to get through this um, three-stage process as quickly as possible. The second stage of that is probably the most critical bit to being able to start uh, construction, uh, the installation license, um, and we'll be looking to get that in place by uh, the first quarter of 2023. We've done some work on securing some land in the area, which will de-risk the project as far as you know uh, development impediments, um, and that's moving along well. And we've got a, a couple of other negotiations currently pending. So with that, you know, the community has become really supportive of the project. Um, you know, we, we source most of our people from the region. Most of our supply at the moment is, is coming from the local communities. Um, we've got some social programs running with the local um, towns. Uh, some of that's in relation to health and, and water quality. Um, but a big portion of that over the next sort of 12 to 18 months is going to be in, uh, improving the quality of the roads in the region. And we're sort of well down that path of, of doing that. And that's being, re being received really nicely by um, the local municipalities of St. Felix de Xingu and uh, Tukuma. I think when you look at the project overall and this value adding study, um, and you look at the amount of dollars that are going to come out and be deployed back into that community, it is very significant. So we're talking over 2 billion reais sort of US $400 million worth of taxes and royalties going back into the region. Um, and just thinking that 65% uh, of the government royalty um, is earmarked for the municipality where the project is located. So there's a big incentive for, for everyone in the region to get behind the project. Um, and we're already starting to see that quite significantly. Our COVID response has been uh, pretty strong internally. Um, we're doing everything that we can to keep our people safe. Um, there's a lot of things that go on in Brazil um, and, you know, I think they're making pretty good headway in respect to uh, immunising people. I think they're up to about 60, 60 million people across the country. Um, so probably well beyond where we are here in Australia. Um, but for us, um, it's really about focusing in on our people and we've, um, we've got a camp on site to try to uh, minimise the impact of COVID. So the timeline, as we've talked about, um, is really targeting the end of 2024 for first production. Um, to do that, we want to be starting the build in Q3 2023. Um, and that, again, is driven by the environmental approval process. So we'll start that, get the key document, this environmental impact assessment lodged in the next couple of months, um, and then work our way through the approvals process such that we've got the installation license granted by the first quarter of 2023. Um, still a lot of work to be done, but we think that uh, it's, it's achievable. Um, we've just got to make sure we do everything the right way. And then outside of the project that's already defined, I think there's going to be, you know, the board has, uh, on the back of those really robust economics, um, committed to going straight to definitive feasibility study. And I think that's been an important step. Um, you know, we, we see the robustness of these numbers um, with a, over a billion uh, in MPV and an IRR over 50%, those are numbers that are quite compelling. Um, the board is very comfortable making that move, making that decision to actually go straight into definitive work. 
during that definitive work, there's a number of areas where we can look to optimise the project further, uh, certainly from a CapEx and OpEx point of view, once we start pricing those things in hard numbers in local currency. I think once that happens, we'll, we have some uh, potential to bring down our operating and capital cost numbers. There's definitely more work to be done in relation to the mine schedule and optimising that, as well as sort of looking at the uh, process route. And that may include just how we deal with the mixed sulphide precipitate and what sort of commodities we we're able to pull out as a byproduct. You can see from the tornado chart there that the, you know, the project is highly leveraged to the nickel price. And just as an example, you know, at nine dollars a pound, which we don't think is unreasonable for when you know this project is coming on stream, the MPV of the project pushes out over 1.6 billion Aussie dollars and an IRR of 70%. So again, on a 13-year project with quick payback and producing 20,000 tonnes a year plus of of nickel and sulphate, then I think we're um, we're in really good shape and have a huge amount of leverage to the upside in nickel prices. The other aspect of, of the, I guess, the opportunity and growth that for the project is in the exploration. Um, we've got a 65,000 metre drill program underway at the moment. As I said, we've got four diamond rigs and one RC rig on site. Presently, we've got another three diamond rigs due to come to site in June. Um, that'll help us get through all of the infill and extensional work. We're doing a number of holes in the into uh, and stepping out into some of the deeper target areas, um, which we haven't really had to test previously. But we've also got an active uh, greenfields program of uh, 25,000 metres where we're using the RC for that work. You can see in some of the cross sections here that uh, the mineralisation is still quite significant at the base of the pits. So on the on the left there, Jaguar Central, um, a hole that we got late last year of 30 metres at 3.3% nickel. Um, was pushed down the pit, so that's getting picked up there, and we're now uh, trying to drive that area deeper as we chase the mineralisation down plunge and down dip. Um, the other area is is obviously growth as we drill deeper. Um, there's some EM targets which are a great marker for us for sulphide mineralisation, and um, with that, I think as we drill deeper holes, you know, three, four, five hundred metre deep holes we'd expect to find uh, more significant zones of uh, nickel mineralisation. The RC work um, is focused on these areas in the green. Um, we've done a lot of work on infilling the soils, infilling the mag, uh, doing fixed loop EM work. And we've now got to a point where the RC rig is out there working. Liao's the uh, first project area where we're, we're working at the moment. And we'll look forward to bringing results of that over the next few months. So I guess pulling all that back together, um, you know, and for investors, it's really about the value equation. I think at a market cap of around 250, 260 million dollars, I think there's a huge amount of upside uh, given what we've delivered today in the value adding scoping study. Um, we've got a shareholder base that's uh, supportive of what we're doing. Um, they understand the direction that we're headed. Um, we've well cashed up with over 20 million dollars in the bank. So all of the work that we need to do through 2021 for the um, definitive feasibility study work is well under well in place. Um, there's a lot of drilling to be done, as I said, extensional and RC work, and we've got the team in country to support the work activities that we need to undertake. Uh, that's led by Bruno Scarpelli, our country manager in Brazil, and Gaudis Montresor, who's our exploration manager in, in country and doing a fantastic job of, of keeping the drill rigs going in what has been pretty challenging conditions uh, with COVID over the last 12 months. So we have a strong nickel focus. Um, you can see from the numbers today, they are really, really significant. We've got a, a very large resource and I think that will stand up um, very well against anyone else on the ASX. Um, very significant production profile going forward, which will, uh, and I think which will stack up on a global basis. Um, we'll be a sort of top 10 nickel producer if we're up and doing 20,000 tonnes a year. The economics are really solid, um, as I said, Capital cost is relatively low, operating costs are low, high cash flow generation, um, strong MPVs, early payback, great IRR. So with all of that, I think um, we will close it there, but uh, obviously happy to take any questions uh, coming from the people out there listening today. Thanks. Thanks very much, Darren. Uh, we do have plenty of questions, which is great. Lots of engagement from our audience. So good. Thanks, thanks everyone. 
Um, before we dive into them, just a, one from myself, if I could kick off. Um, your timeline, I think, indicates two resource updates before completion of the, the DFS. So mm -hmm. you've, you've outlined today that you're going straight from scoping study into DFS, mm -hmm. which is pretty significant in itself um, in terms of development pathway. Can you just quickly run through the, that sequencing of uh, of how the, the the resource updates will flow into the ultimate study and perhaps yep. give people a sense of you know the ultimate scale of the project potentially? Yeah, look, I don't know what the what the final size of it will be. What I am comfortable in saying that with drilling, we'd expect the resource to continue to grow. Um, you know, obviously, five hundred and sixty thousand tons of contained nickel is already pretty significant in its own right. Um, but there is still a lot more work to be done. You know, most of the resource is down to sort of 250 metres. Um, you know, so as we go deeper, we'd expect to find more. That's what the EM targets are telling us. As we drill some of these sort of more greenfields targets, you know, the soils and the fixed loop EM are telling us that there's targets there. So if we can bring those in, we'll expect the resource to lift. And that's why I think, you know, we'll probably have two uh, resource upgrades before we get and finalise the, the definitive feasibility study. And, you know, loosely, we're talking about doing that every six months. So there should be enough uh, activity from the drill rig coming through with results that will actually feed into resource upgrades progressively through that period of time. Okay. So the, the resource update in Q2 next year will be the one that will go and will underpin the, the DFA. Yeah, look, there could actually be another one post that. You know, we're, I guess, looking forward 12 months at this stage. Um, but, you know, there could be another one towards the end of 2022. And it just depends on, on the timing and when we're pulling that um, DFS together. Okay. Let's dive into these questions. Sure. Let's um, go for it. Uh, okay. So um, I think I might have covered that first one. Um, sorry. Uh, there we go. Right. Do you have any plans to list on the North American market in the future, um, like BSX has done? I think the gentleman's referring to Blackstone yep. uh, Minerals. Yeah, look, I mean, we've looked at that. They've listed on the ATC um, market. And, you know, it's something that is amenable to us. We're not quite sure exactly how much, how effective that is. Um, we do have a, I guess, a North American shareholder base you know, with, you know, Dundee being a significant shareholder, Sprott being a significant shareholder. Um, so we're always looking at whether, you know, TSX type listings make sense for us. At this stage, we haven't made any decisions in relation to that, um, but it's something that we continue to look at. And it may still be that, you know, that's where, um, you know, the market takes us. But, you know, for now, we're, we're pretty comfortable with the ASX. Okay. Uh Next question. So you acquired this project from Vale, and I think that came with Vale having certain, um, uh, I guess, first right of refusal mm -hmm. over over future offtake. So um, the question from this gentleman is that, in terms of what you've outlined with the scoping, the value add scoping study today, how yep. does Vale potentially fit in terms of of offtake and potential financing? Are, are they would they be sort of um, cut out of the the loop, given what you're contemplating? With, no. Uh, um, so the deal with Vale gave them a right to product. Um, the product could be determined by Centaurus. So they have no direction as to whether we go concentrate, sulfate, metal, you know, whatever it is, but they will still have a right and opportunity to be able to buy that product. Um, and that's all premised around arm's length market-based pricing. Um, you know, it's always been implied in our agreement with them that if they came in with some form of, um, I guess, offtake, then they may come with some funding attached to it. But I think the economics of this study um, clearly show that it could support pretty significant uh, debt, uh, just simply because the cash flows are so strong. When you look at the margin, when you look at the cash flow generation being 100 million, 190 million US dollars per year, you know, that does go a long way to sort of paying for the project. So if you think about it, you know, 190 million pretty much is, you know, it says it in the payback, 1.8 years, and you pretty much paid back your, your capital. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I guess coming, turning that back on to the question, um, they have the rights. We don't know whether they'll want to pursue a, a sulfate product or not. That's a conversation that we've still got to have with Vale. Um, and that's something now that we've been able to complete the study that we can start to advance those conversations. Okay. 
Next question is a sort of a related one. Uh, the gentleman says that uh, Joe Biden has indicated that he wants US battery makers to import metals for that purpose. Do you expect direct approaches from US car makers and battery makers? Yeah, look, I think that's definitely a path that uh, we'll be headed on now. I mean, I, I guess when I look at the study and the results, for me, it feels like that we are on the path to producing nickel sulfate. You know, the economics really are quite compelling. So that does mean that we are going directly into the car makers field of influence. And I would expect that given some of those noises that have been made by um, President Biden, that they will then be those manufacturers will then be looking outside of country to do that. Um, you know, so this fits perfectly in, in that regard that it's a sulphide project. It's, it's low carbon emissions in its own right compared to the laterite projects. Um, it's got been based off renewable power, which again feeds into that thematic. So I think it's got all the right attributes of you know being really strong economically, but also having all the right ESG credentials to be able to make it a, a project of appeal for a very broad audience. Great. Um, next question. Yeah. Um, the company is clearly focused on its nickel project, but mm -hmm. how likely is it that you can leverage some value from your iron ore asset in order to advance the nickel development, particularly given the high iron ore price at the mm -hmm. moment? If not now, then when? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fair point. There's definitely a, an asset of value there uh, with the Jambero Iron Ore Project. We don't talk about it a lot, um, but it is a advanced uh, iron ore project. It really needs offtake to, I guess, open it up to being financed. Um, and that's some work that we still have conversation about. Um, you know, the market in Brazil domestically is still uh, strong and um, we feel like there are a number of opportunities there in relation to that. And we're exploring a whole bunch of things right now. But for most of our guys, you know, 98, 99% of the team, that's all about the nickel. Um, but there's definitely at the top level with myself and uh, with Bruno in Brazil, that there's a, a strong focus to actually try to get something done with the iron ore because we do feel like it's got enormous value, particularly at iron ore prices where they are. Would a, a demerger or spin-off of, of iron ore be something you'd yeah. consider? Yeah, no, look, I think that's it's definitely on the cards. I think it's probably better to be done if we were looking at it on the back of getting some sort of offtake and uh, doing something different to how it's uh, how the project's currently sitting. But, you know, we've got to weigh that up at any given point in time as where the market is. Fair enough. Um, next question. Uh, this gentleman says, the company at times seems to have trouble uh, cutting through with investors. The project is seemingly heavily discounted to Australian peers. Is the reluctance related to Brazil and how do you overcome this to reflect true value going forward? Mm -hmm. we've, we've had this discussion. Yeah, times. no, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely a Brazil factor at play. Um, if this project was in Australia, I'm sure our market cap would be two to three times higher than where we are right now. Um, I think that discount is way too big. Um, I think, you know, Brazil has had issues with tailings dam in the past, but I think we've got a very neat solution in respect to that with this IWL that we're looking at, at building into the project. I think from a sovereign risk point of view, there's, you know, you've got a very clean mining title structure. Uh, you've got a very clean royalty system. You don't have governments participating in the projects as such. So when you look at the actual mining system, it's very, very similar to what you have in Australia. Um, and I guess then I look at, okay, well, where are we located? And we're in the Karajas. This is an infrastructure rich region. Vale have been operating in this part of the world for you know 50 years. S11D is there, which is the biggest, highest grade iron ore mine in the world. They've got Salobo, which is the biggest copper mine in Brazil, second biggest IOCG behind Olympic Dam. So when you've got those sort of developments there, there is already a lot of infrastructure in there and a lot of supply and services in there supporting that industry. So for us, trying to get a project up and running in Brazil, it being in that part of the world is a huge positive. So I think the combination of you know what we're doing, I think it'll come through over time, we'll show that we'll deliver against it. We've been operating there for 12 years. We know the ins and outs of the country and it doesn't hold any fears for us about going and getting this project up. Um, I think investors are going to need to get their head around it. I'm going to have to continue to 
um, tell that story over and over. Um, but I think it's it's I think the the discount is way way too big. Fair enough. Um, thanks, Darren. Let's go now to a, a reasonably detailed question. So on slide six, we had a we showed a, a, a base case of twenty four million tons with an IRR of fifty four percent, and the value add case had an IRR of fifty two percent. So this gentleman is saying um, he'd expect there to be some economies of scale based on an increased production rate, which isn't reflected in the IRR. So could you explain the, the, the differential between uh, the base case and the value add in terms of the internal rate of return? Yeah, look, I mean, the internal rate of return will, will vary between project to project, and a lot of that's to do with the, with the capital spend. Um, you know, I think over longer life projects, you generally see IRRs that are lower. So this has become a, it's a 13 year project instead of a 10 year project. And the, the lift in the, the net present value gets driven by the fact that, you know, you've got a higher revenue stream, which drives bigger pits, um, more underground development in there. So more metal coming out with a higher sulphide nickel recovery. So you've got this sort of increasing metal, but you're also extending that over a longer period of time. Uh, which I think then drives to where we are, where we've got a pretty similar IRR. Okay, great. Another sort of reasonably detailed question on your on the flow sheet that you put up, and mm -hmm. I'm pleased this gentleman's asked this question because I was going to ask it as well. We, we talk about a, a, an MSP or a mixed sulphide precipitate, I think mm -hmm. that stands for. Can you tell us a bit more about what, what, what that is exactly and also how much it adds to the bottom line uh, um, if it's just a concentrate. Can you expand on that aspect a little bit? Yep, so mixed sulphide precipitate is effectively all your other minerals that are coming out of your production. So what you're trying to do to produce nickel sulphate is have a very clean and pure uh, nickel precipitate, which then gets crystallized um, and sold as your, as your nickel sulphate. But in order to do that, you need to remove all of your other elements that are sitting there. But as we do that, you know, we pull out a this mixed sulphide precipitate, which is uh, zinc and cobalt rich. Uh, it's got some copper in it. It's got some nickel in it. Um, as I said, I think there's some opportunities to, to do more with that MSP to a certain extent as far as breaking it out into even, you know, different products again. And, and uh, but from a, a revenue perspective, um, I think it adds about $250, $300 million over the life of the project um, from that. Whereas if you're producing a concentrate, you generally wouldn't get those as paid for in your concentrate. Mm -hmm. So if you revert back to the, the base case, we got paid a little bit for cobalt that was there. Uh, copper, we were below threshold and we weren't getting paid anything for the zinc that's sitting in the mineralization. But as because you've been able to, I guess, refine that process and you're able to pull out those things in this mixed sulfide precipitate, then you can look to be selling that product separately. Excellent. So significant. Uh, yeah, it's, it's significant enough to, to be doing more work on as well. I think there's definitely some optimization steps that we can go through to, through the definitive feasibility study, which could enhance that some, some more. Okay. The next question is a, a reasonably big picture mm -hmm. forward look at the at the at the lithium iron battery market and the lithium market that um, this investor says if if the lithium iron battery is eventually replaced by electric glass batteries, will there still be a place for nickel in the EV market? Yeah, look, there's probably smarter people than me out there that uh, could answer that question. But I do feel that if you're if you're looking for, um, I guess, the density of the batteries so that you can go further, and I, I guess I look at you know things like what Tesla are trying to do with their trucks and all of that. That, from what I can understand, still is going to need nickel. Um, as I said, there might be better people out there that thinks alternative technologies and batteries can um, overcome some of that. But I suspect that if you want high-end cars or you want um, you know, trucks that are gonna be able to uh, be electric, then I think you're still gonna need nickel. So, yep, it's a question on supply demand, but I'm, I guess I'm leaning, you know, as you would when you're in a, in a nickel pro company and project that you know, we, we think the EV thematic is real and that, that nickel is always going to be a required part of that mix. Sure. 
Okay, next question. Um, how are you dealing with the delays that are being experienced in assay results? I'm assuming Brazil is no different to mm -hmm. Australia and other parts of the world where we are seeing huge delays in, yep. in assay turnaround. More rigs uh, means obviously you're generating lots of samples, but if you can't get the cores processed, how do you how are you managing that that situation? Yeah, look, I mean we've we've built up a pretty good relationship with ALS over the time that been we've been working on the Jaguar project. Um, and last year they during COVID starting, they were um, going along extremely well. Um, you, you then had a few, you know, second and third wave of COVID towards the back end of last year, um, the, over Christmas time, that uh, meant that, you know, some of the samples getting out of Brazil were a little bit uh, slow and moving. Also, some of the labs in Peru and Vancouver were, were being shut for periods of time. And it's, they're really trying to grapple with clawing that back. But, you know, they're indicating to us that that is uh, underway. We've also... Um, I, th I think in a large part because of our project, ALS have actually opened up a sample prep lab in Paltapebis in the Carajas um, so that the samples can go there and then they can be taken directly to either Peru or, or Vancouver. So I think we'll see over time that they, the, I guess the time delay that we've seen in, in assay turnarounds start to reduce. Um, we've got a huge backlog of results that are still pending at the moment, um, but, you know, they're representing to us that those things will be caught up and, you know, back by sort of July, August, we should be back to sort of normal term around times. And I guess the mineralization's reasonably visual as well. So it's not like you're, you're drilling blind, waiting on, on results, which can happen in some other commodities. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, the guys got a pretty good handle and they've got their eye in on what they're looking at, particularly in the core. Obviously, when we're drilling RC, it's a little bit more challenging looking at rock chips. But, you know, again, we've got an XRF uh, gun on site which allows us to get a handle on, you know, whether we're in a zone of mineralisation or not. Uh, but in the core, the guys have definitely got a good handle. They can spot the pentlodite, they can spot the millerite. Um, so they've got a, a pretty good nous of, OK, yeah, we've hit the zone or not. Sure. A couple more exploration-related questions mm -hmm. just to wrap up. So in what areas will the three diamond rigs arriving in June be drilling? Yeah, look, at the, I guess if you, rather than say where those rigs will go, I guess if you look at the seven rigs that we will have on site, um, you'll probably find that half of those are working on infill. Um, so in order to get to definitive feasibility study, we need to have as much of this resource across uh, in the indicated category so that that indicated resource can be converted to reserves and obviously go out with the, with the study. Um, but then, yeah, there's a number of areas that we want to start drilling deeper holes, and we're already starting to do that. Um, you know, I think there's a, a hole that we're on at the moment that we're, we're down at 500 metres. So, you know, we're starting to drill some of these deeper holes, uh, testing some of the zones underneath Jaguar South, testing some of those zones under Jaguar Central. Um, so it'll be a combination of, of doing some step out, you know, ex and extensional work as well as doing the, the infill. But the infill is... is important um, in getting to the end result of, of uh, the economics of the project. Just one final one. I yep. think we've got through all the questions, but I might just sort of wrap it up with one last exploration question. Sure. So you spoke about uh, the, the, the Greenfields targets and that work is now underway with an mm -hmm. RC rig. Do you, do you believe that there's scope to find additional deposits of, of the scale of, of what you already have in, in the tenement? I mean, there's obviously yep. all the focus, I'm assuming, has been on the on the sort of brownfields areas. So is, is there potential for major new discoveries at, at Jaguar? Yeah, look, I, I think our, our geologists will characterise it by saying that the areas we're exploring now are more likely to find discrete type bodies like Onsa Preta and Onsa Rosa. Um, you know, to find the quantum of an ore body like Jaguar South, for example, that may not be there uh, in the context. Um, so, yeah, we've drilled, I think, about 300 drill holes, diamond drill holes into the Jaguar and the Onsa areas, and we've had 10 drill holes in total on that Greenfields uh, area. It might be a little bit higher than that now. But I definitely think that there's more mineralisation to be found. It just hasn't been drilled historically. Um, 
Whether that's going to allow us to double the resource, probably not. Is it allow us to significantly increase the resource? Probably. You know, it's just got to we got to do the work and obviously make those discoveries as we go. Excellent. Another question just popped up, so oh, yeah. we'll make sure we, uh, yeah, we cover get them to off. It. Um, the question is: What are the regulatory processes uh, to, to get access to water for the project? And will you recycle from tailings? Uh, definitely recycling from tailings. Um, you know, we've, we've we're very focused on the water balance and where that goes. Um, we can access fresh water from uh, rivers close by, sort of within two or three kilometres. That's a matter of applying to uh, the regulatory body, bodies for that. Um, we don't see that as a problem to being able to access the water. Um, you do. This is an area of Brazil that gets two to three metres of rainfall per year. So, you know, there's definitely significant um, amounts of water, but you've still got to go through the right processes to be able to tap into that. Um, we also think there's a number of aquifers that are that are there from deeper sources. So all of that's available to us. Um, so I definitely don't think water is going to be a, a problem for the project and we'll be recirculating and recycling as much of that as we can. So that's the approval process for that will run. Yeah, that's, of part, of, yeah, that's yeah. part of the environmental yeah. approval process. Fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think that that is about it. So, okay. Uh, Thanks for everyone very much for your questions. Great questions and great Absolutely. engagement. Yep. Um, and uh, we will have a recording of this uh, up uh, on YouTube and on the on the various websites and in our weekly wrap uh, in the course of the week. But uh, if anyone does have any further questions, uh, please contact Darren here yep. at the Feel Central Office. Absolutely. And I might just hand back to you, Darren, just a couple of closing closing comments. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think. Thanks for everyone for sitting in today and appreciate the questions. I think it's always good to have that level of interaction. Um, all I would say is that, you know, we, we feel like the, the project is, is a very significant project. Um, you know, it's going to put us in the realms of some, you know, pretty significant uh, nickel producer. And I think for the value case is well and truly there. Um, at a market cap of $250 million, we think that it's a, that's a, it's a really good uh, value proposition for people looking to get exposure to the space. So I would encourage you to take a look. And as Nicholas said, if there's any further questions, feel free to, to contact us at the office or uh, through other channels. So thank you.